solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as the trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. David, thank you so much for making the time on the Play to Potential podcast. Really excited to be talking to someone like you who spent decades studying this topic of uh, interpersonal relationships. I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to this. David, before we get into the book that you've recently co-authored, um, uh, I'm curious about people's journeys in this podcast. You've spent five decades uh, teaching this course at Stanford. Can you talk to us a little bit about the arc of your career? It seems like you've stayed in one place for a long time, but I'm sure you've reinvented yourself several times over in these five decades. Can you talk to us a little bit about the arc of your journey over the last uh, several years? Yes. Um, I was uh, recruited to come to Stanford to uh, develop this course. And... Uh, much of the first uh, 30 years was in um, uh, developing it, getting other faculty growing. Uh, it's now the most popular MBA elective in the school. Over 85% of the students take it. And I think the arc has been um, understanding the complexity of interpersonal relations and figuring out how this can work with different people from different countries, from different backgrounds. And um, having it apply not only to a work situation, but also to personal relationships. So it's been a process of continual discovery and continual learning for myself. Hmm. Hmm. And what sorts of things have you said no to, uh, David? Uh, I'm sure as this course got popular, as the word spread, uh, you would have gotten your share of offers and opportunities. I'm curious about how you've stayed on this path. I, I think I have. I haven't been very tempted to leave this path because it is so personally rewarding. I think the other options have been secondary. I started a professional organization on experiential teaching, but um, that never took me away from this course. And I turned that over to other people. Mm -hmm. And I have done some consulting, but in a certain sense, the consulting was largely taking the learnings from this course and applying it to executives and senior executives. So, um, any sort of other activities have been uh, related to this. And I've never been tempted to uh, to get off this path. It has been, as I said, uh, very personally rewarding, not only because of what I could discover, but also what I could learn about myself. Wow. Uh, that's such ref uh, it's, it's such a refreshing thought, uh, especially in a world today where we are looking at people moving jobs every two years, three years, five years. So to find somebody who's really, you know, gone deep, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, really inspiring. So, uh, but, but what I would add to that is mm. that I feel I have been moving, mm. uh, but I wouldn't define it as moving between institutions or between mm. fields, mm. uh, but it has been moving more broadly within this area. So every year has felt new. Hmm. How have you, maybe staying with this, uh, David, how have you thought about staying relevant and refreshing yourself? Uh, is that something that one has to be a lot more deliberate about, especially when you're in one institution? Uh, or is that has that been an organic process and you've let your curiosity lead your way? Well, I think I've always been curious, but one of the exciting things about this course is that the instructor learns as much as the students do. Mm. This is not something that I do to the students. I mm. do it with the students. Mm. 
Hmm. And as the students give feedback to each other, uh, I get a lot of feedback uh, myself. Hmm. And uh, so it's it's not necessarily a process of how do I force myself to learn? It's uh, I think that I would have to work hard not to learn. <laughs> Uh, in a way that captures the essence of how i feel during some of my coaching conversations right it's it's been such a rewarding journey just uh, to to be in a position to help leaders and and uh, by extension help oneself by you know observing that uh, journey and feedback from them so uh, and they actually pay you for that <laughs> <laughs> that's true for your own personal development uh, true that's a privilege indeed uh Diving into your book, uh, David, uh, your book talks about uh, a special type of relationship that you call exceptional. Um, and you say there are six hallmarks to an exceptional relationship. Can you sort of talk to us about what you mean by exceptional and uh, the six hallmarks? Yes. First of all, let me say that relationships are in a continuum. Uh, we have some that are uh, casual. We have some that are more, have deeper uh, a connection to them. We have some that are quite strong. Uh, we have those that are intimate. And at the upper end, we have those that we call exceptional. <clears throat> we say all relationships and certainly exceptional relationships have these six characteristics. The first one is, to what extent can I be myself? Uh, can I let you know, David, that's what, that that is relevant to our relationship. I don't share everything with you, but what do we need in order to, um, to build a connection? And also, can I not have to present an image, uh, present uh, something that I'm not, which I think is very relevant to, uh, certainly to teachers who do a lot of image uh, projection mm. and to leaders as well, who often walk around saying, if I'm to be a leader, I have to uh, present something other than I am. And so what we look at is to what extent can I let you know, David, in a relevant way? The second thing is, since we're talking about relationship, can I do things that help you be better known as you are? And we all do things that shut down other people. And can we be aware of that and not do that? And can we encourage the other person's also personal self-disclosure? Now, letting yourself be known, each of us, also means that we become vulnerable. We mm. uh, share some things that uh, the other might not approve of. So the third dimension is, um, can I trust that what I share will be used against me? And that's, of course, relevant in organizations because information gets passed around quickly in organizations. I don't want to share something that's going to hurt my career or hurt my uh, effectiveness, mm -hmm. but also it relates to this relationship. Am I going to say something where you'll judge me negatively and may even reject me? Fourth dimension is, can we be honest with each other? Mm. And honesty isn't sharing everything, but it's sharing what is most important for us to relate and to do work together. And can you have confidence that what I'm telling you is what I really mean and what's most important? And you don't have to read between the lines. Fifth, any relationship, and I've been married 55 years, any relationship has glitches to it, has problems, has hmm. uh, disagreements, has even conflict. Uh, that's uh, true to all relationships. And uh, can we, in this relationship, raise those? Not only resolve them, but resolve them in a way that might deepen the relationship. And finally, hmm. we say, we find that relationships have the uh, quality of, are we committed to each other's growth and development? Uh, if I see you doing things that are hurting yourself, am I committed enough to you that I will take the risk of saying that? Now, these six dimensions are also on a continuum. Hmm. And you don't have to be at the very top to be exceptional but you have to be high up on all of them to start to approach those. And the nice thing is about these six is they can give you a clue as to which ones you may want to work on 
to deepen the present relationships you have. Hmm. Hmm. And picking on one of the things that uh, caught my attention, as as you said it, uh, David, you talk about resolving conflict in a way that deepens the relationship. Um, can can you say more about uh, uh, what it takes to 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 be able to resolve conflicts in a in a healthy way, which which strengthens the relationship? Yes, a, a lot depends on how the issue is raised. So I want to go back to the whole thing of honesty. Mm-hmm. When I hear somebody say, well, I'm going to be brutally honest, I find they're usually more brutal than they are honest. <laughs> and uh, this gets into how we define feedback. Mm. We could get into it if you'd like to. But we find that if you stick with behavioral feedback, Hmm. And I raise issues because I see this not as you being a bad person, but as this getting in the way of our working together, being friends together, and it's a sign that something is a little wrong. So the image we use is, let's imagine you're driving to work, and I know driving in India can be (laughs) quite challenging having been there. Uh, But let's assume that the uh, motor is sputtering a little bit and the steering is a little loose and the wheels seem to be thumping a bit. Mm -hmm. You don't say, bad car, bad car. You say, hmm, something's wrong. I better get it worked on. Mm -hmm. And we have to have the same sort of orientation when there's a conflict. When there's a conflict, it's not that you're wrong or bad or I am. but Something's getting in the way. And can we sit down jointly and try to figure this out? So that leads us into problem solving, not into blame or accusation. Let's talk about feedback, David. I think uh, as I read your book, this whole notion of uh, over the net uh, really, really caught my attention. I think uh, when I was at McKinsey, uh, we were taught the SBI model of feedback, situation behavior impact in the way you sort of communicate um, feedback, but I love the metaphor of, you know, playing a racket sport across the net and not cro- playing. Uh, you've you've heard commentators say you you can only control your side of the net. I really <laughs> love right. the way I really love the way you sort of map that to the process of uh, feedback. So can you sort of bring that to life for us? This notion of over the net and not crossing the net. Yes, yeah. We start with the assumption. In fact, we say this in the book. Carol and I believe you can say almost anything to almost anybody if you stick with your reality. Mm -hmm. In fact, we add, after two glasses of wine, we drop the almost because (laughs) we sort of in our heart of hearts think you can say anything to anybody if you stick with your reality. But being academics, we have sort of uh, cover ourselves. So what do we mean by three realities? In interacting, I only know two realities, and you know two realities. So let's take, give up you and me. Reality number one is my motives, intentions, which leads to my behavior. Reality number two, my words, my nonverbals, my tone, etc. The third reality is the impact on you. How does it affect you? So the model is similar to the McKinsey model but we, I think, elaborate a little differently. And what we say is, I know two realities, my motives, and I can see the behavior. You know two realities, you can see the behavior, and you know the effect on you. But you don't know my motives, and I don't know the impact. But I need to know the impact if I'm to be effective. So we then envision a... Uh, we actually envision two tennis nets, but I'm going to talk about one. Mm-hmm. The first one is between my intentions, motives and intentions, and my behavior. The second net is between behavior and your effect, but let me focus on the first. Mm-hmm. As in tennis, you can't play in the other person's back court. We often get into trouble so frequently, and conflict gets worse, because you, the recipient, my behavior, don't stay on your side of the court. So think of how much 
But what uh, feedback is so commonly used in organizations? We say to somebody else, well, you just don't want to be a team player. Uh, you just want to put your own area. You, you don't care about uh, me or, or my area. Uh, you just want to dominate. Well, you're over the net because you're making statements about my motives and intentions that you don't know. It's a, it's a story you're making up. Hmm. And so when we say, stick with your reality, you could say anything. Let's uh, imagine that um, you're now feeling a, a little tuned out because you're experiencing me as giving you more information than you want. So if you were to say, well, David, you just want to show how smart you are. I'm going to get defensive. But the other problem with that is I can just say, no, I don't. Hmm. And it has little impact. But if you stick with your reality and you say, David, I'm feeling bothered and I'm feeling a little tuned out because mm. I experiencing you as going on and on and talking too much. Mm. Now, now I can't say, no, you don't, mm. or I'm over your net. Mm. You no, know, I'm likely to say, well, I'm sorry. That's not my intention. I'm trying to be helpful. And you can say, well, I'm glad you're trying to be helpful. And I'd like you to be helpful, but the way you're now acting isn't helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And now we could have a conversation of how I can be helpful. And so much of conflict is accusations, uh, making up these stories, and people not sticking with what they knew, know, which is, this is how I feel. This is how your behavior is impacting me. Mm. And this is how it's getting, interfering with our relationship. I'm and staying with that... Say, uh... If I may, David, yeah. and staying with that tennis rally that you just sort of outlined, uh, you sort of spoke about staying on the same side of the net uh, right. and what would be uh, crossing the net. Is there something around the how we come across the emotional state, the regulation, the listening? Can you sort of paint a little bit of uh, context around um, the manner in which uh, we frame these, uh, you know, uh, responses? Well, the better the relationship, the more variance we can have. But uh, I think that I don't have to be super careful or pussyfoot around, as we say in the States. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm not experiencing this, so I'm going to make this up, Deepak, so please. So I think if, uh, if you did some stuff that bothered me, I think I could say, hey, Deepak, uh, come on. I'm really feeling bothered about what you're doing. And it's getting in the way of, of this interview. I think I could be forceful like that. I'm talking about myself. I am bothered. Hmm. And it's hurting me. And assuming you're concerned about the relationship, it's hurting you too. That's very different than me attacking you or making suppositions about your motives or intentions. Hmm. Hmm. Got it. Got it. So, and, and I want to stress this because you don't have to be so careful and so nice, particularly if my concern is for you as well as me and for the relationship. You know, if I'm really, if something's getting in the way of us working together, I can say that with a lot of feeling. Hey, I'm, I'm really upset about what's going on. And you're like, you say, well, what is it? If I could stick with the behavior hmm. and how it's impacting me. Hmm. Now I want to come back to the whole notion of self-disclosure. One of the ways we tend to protect ourselves is not to let ourselves be vulnerable. Now we have to be careful about vulnerability. But if we are interacting, it often helps if I'm feeling hurt or if I'm feeling put down or if I'm feeling envious to say it. If I could say, hey, Deepak, I really felt hurt by that comment. 
Hmm. Um, now, the worst thing you could say, which I don't think you would, is, well, that's your problem, David. And I would say, no. I say, that doesn't help me. It hurts a little bit more. But it hurts both of us. It's not just my problem. Because this hmm. is a consequence. And you see how honest a conversation we could have this way if we each stick with our reality. Hmm. Hmm. And building on that, David, uh, you've been uh, bringing this to students across 50 years. Um, it's one of those things where it's easy to get it conceptually in the head. Uh, <laughs> in your experience, where, uh, you know, what are the common places where people often trip up in bringing this to life in their respective uh, tennis courts? Well, let me first say, you're absolutely right. It's easier conceptually to get it than to do it. In fact, not infrequently, my wife says to me with exasperation, you teach this stuff, why don't you do it? <laughs> because one of the problems is we all act like, well, when we first of all, we, we protect ourselves. And in protecting ourselves, we try not to be vulnerable. But secondly, we try to understand the other person. So we psych them out. So we so quickly go to make up stories. So if you were to um, do something three times in a row, it sort of natural me to say, well, what sort of person has Deepak to do that? Mm -hmm. And then I'm starting to make a story. And as soon as I make a story, I'm going to accuse you of it. Well, Deepak, aren't you doing that just because of blah, 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 blah. And what we forget is the story I make up is my story. Hmm. I don't know it. And not only that, it's unnecessary. Because if I say, gee, I really was hurt when you said that, you're likely to share your intention. You're like, they say, well, I didn't mean that. I was just starting to get impatient and da 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 da. So I don't hmm. have to make up this story, but we do it so naturally. Hmm. And a related question here, David, is very often when you're in the heat of a, of a moment, of an interaction, very often uh, we, we aren't mindful of how we are coming across. You know, a lot of, let's say, the if we stick with this uh, metaphor of the net, um, I would imagine some of the stuff uh, that transpires is often in the blind spot of that person. You know, I don't even know that I'm doing this. Any any reflections on that, uh, just in terms of tuning in to what's going on? Well, I'll answer that in a minute, but I think the bigger hmm. problem is we often don't know what we feel. Hmm. And... I think we need to start with being aware of our feelings. And not infrequently, when Carol and I work with each other, and we get into our own disagreements, one of us will say, wait a minute, I'm not sure I know what I'm feeling. And we stop. And we sort of ask ourselves, I wonder what I'm feeling. Hmm. So that's the major problem. When you're talking about blind spots, one of the interesting things about this mode of interaction is if we can get into a conversation, I'm likely to discover my blind spots. So let's say, um, and again, I'm making this up. You're, you're not giving me enough real data that I can use. <laughs> <laughs> you're too nice. So I'm going to make this up. So, so let's assume that um, you've done something that's really bothered me. I say, hey, Deepak, I really feel hurt by that, uh, and so on. And you say, Jim, I'm, I'm sorry. And then you might say, gee, what's interesting, David, is this is the third time that you said that. I wonder what's going on. Well, that might get me to reflect. You're not telling me what you think is going on because you realize you don't know, but you're puzzled. You say, hmm. David, what's going on? 
And I'm like, oh, what I realize is that uh, I guess I tend to get competitive, particularly with men. Oh, so I'm learning something. I'm not only learning the impact of my behavior, but I'm learning something about me. Hmm. So I don't have to have it all figured out. What we say is, if you know your feelings and you can identify the behavior, you're 90% there. Let's talk about that, David. Um, we're all taught language in a formal way. English, the alphabet, the grammar. Um, t t tell us a little bit about the vocabulary of emotions. You know, uh, where do we start, and uh, you know, what's what's a good place for us to get a sense of what that uh, the wheel of emotions looks like? Is there a, is there a um, is there an approach that you suggest for people to start building that vocabulary? I think there's two things. One is we would say. Um, well, buy the book, and in the appendix is a long list of uh, <laughs> emotions. But that's not nearly as helpful as what is really helpful is as you go through the day, stop and say, I wonder what I'm feeling. We almost always are feeling something. Usually it's at such a low level, it doesn't register unless somebody cuts us off of the road and we get into anger. Um but if you start to do that, you'll start to say, hmm, I'm feeling a little worried about this upcoming meeting. Hmm, I'm really feeling, uh, looking forward to meeting with uh, uh, Nasha. Hmm, I'm uh, really uh, hoping that, and now you're starting to be more in touch with those low level feelings which often aren't low level, but are ones that we have pushed down because mm. we've sort of been trained, um, beware of feelings, leave feelings out of it. Emotions have no place, but emotions are everywhere. Hmm. And at some level, this requires a certain level of uh, mindfulness. Is that is that the right way to frame it? To, to observe ourselves, to observe the others. Uh, what, what what do you suggest uh, to leaders? Can I, excuse, Please. excuse me, let me break in. Please. What I would really stress is mindfulness about ourselves. Mm. Mindfulness about others gets us into story making. Mm. Mm. We may want to be observant of others. Gee, that person went silent. That person seemed to frown. Can we observe their behavior and responses? Hmm. but not be mindfulness about, I wonder what's going on with them because that leads you down a dark rabbit hole hmm. of uh, your, the stories you're making up. <laughs> Sometimes in, 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 in life, it's uh, very often about building trust with a set of people, whether it's professional relationships, personal relationships. And there, uh, at least, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, David, I, I feel that you start building trust only when you sort of have some sense of the other person's intent, which often you uh, you sort of start getting a sense of based on continued behavior uh, from a person. Uh, how do you, uh, you know, back to your point about observing people's behavior and resisting the urge to um, form stories versus the need to um, start curating the world, if I may, so that we know who we can trust, who we don't trust. Do, do you see a tension there somewhere? Not as much. Uh, first of all, I think it helps to, at least I find personally, I take the orientation, I'll trust you until you prove otherwise, hmm. rather than you have to prove your trust because the latter gets me into a suspicious mode, which doesn't help to build openness in our interaction. So I'm gonna start with that orientation. Doesn't mean that I'm gonna trust you with everything, like hmm. hand you my wallet or my bank account, um, but I'm gonna be willing to be more open and be vulnerable. That's the first thing I would do. The more that I disclose 
the more you're likely to trust me and you'll disclose. So I may not need to do much inquiry because you may be saying that I'm signaling I want to be open and you're going to feel, you're going to hopefully and reciprocate. But I think the other thing is, if there are some things which start to become problematic, our first tendency is to make up that story. Mm -hmm. Deepak is clearly the sort of person. Can I get into curiosity? Can I say, Deepak, you said something that uh, puzzled me and I got to say bothered me a little bit. Well, hopefully trust in you by you is going up because I'm being honest. Hmm. And you know that I'm going to be telling you when I'm a little bothered. And I'm going to say, well, what's going on? And you're going to tell me. And I'm going to say, okay, that's helpful. Because I was worried it might be something else, which I would have some trouble with. And you see, I'm continuing to disclose. I'm disclosing that I was bothered, I was unhappy. I also expressed an interest in you. I wanted to know you. I didn't try and play prosecuting attorney. I said, hey, you know, I'd like to know what you're doing. And I think the more you do that, if, if you raise the issues that could threaten trust and surface them, that actually will build trust. Hmm. Hmm. I wanted to go back to one of the things you mentioned, uh, David, in the context of feedback. You know, uh, in the book, you also talk about uh, the feedback sandwich, uh, and you talk about, <laughs> you know, uh, the limitations of the feedback sandwich, where you start with something positive, quickly tick that box, and move to the the brutal part of the brutally honest thing that you said, and then close out with a token positive comment. Can you talk a little bit about? how uh, you've observed uh, this and, and sort of the limitations of this kind of a shallow approach? It's not a limitations, it's dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Anyways, for first, there's research to show that when you do that, the other person never hears a positive. Mm -hmm. They're waiting, they know what's coming. So, so you're wasting your time. The second thing is you're manipulating the other person. And it doesn't help a relationship to feel manipulated because I'm trying to loosen you up with this good compliment. Um, it's also, I think, insulting. It says, mm. oh, you're such a fragile person. I've got to do this. Recently, I was doing another podcast, and the person said, um, uh, my father would say to me, uh, Joe, I have a bone to pick with you. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful way to start. Hmm. You're laying out what the issue is, and you're owning it. I have a bone to pick. Hmm. You could say, uh, there's something going on that's bothering me. I'm upset at what you're doing. I want to talk about it. Or you're doing some stuff which I think is hurting you. I'm being straightforward about saying there's an issue here. Hmm. And this is the issue which I'm involved with. I'm bothered. I'm worried. I'm unhappy. And if you also cannot have built up stories where you have demonized the other. Can you say this with the intention, even though you're annoyed, that you want to be helpful? So this is why I keep on saying you can be very direct. If I say, I'm going to make this up, Deepak, I'm really bothered at what you're doing. And this is hurting us. I think it's hurting you. Hmm. I don't have to soften you up. I'm mm -hmm. laying out what it is. And then I name the behavior and I say, and this is what it's doing to me. 
Hmm. It's closing me down. It's making me feel distant from you. It's uh, not getting me to want to share as much as I want to share. Uh, we got to deal with this. Hmm. I mean, I don't need to say, oh, you're really, you know, that's really a very handsome set of uh, headsets that you've got on. And, oh, by the way, I don't have to do that nonsense. <laughs> hmm. And just maybe the last, sorry. Uh, David, let let me, you. if I may, there is a final cost of the feedback sandwich, and that is it delegitimizes positive feedback. Hmm. Often people don't know the full impact of what they do well. And we don't do a good job of that either. We say to mm. somebody, nice job. Well, that's useless. It makes the other person feel warm and fuzzy. But what was nice about that job? Mm. Again, you have to be behaviorally specific. It's much more helpful to say, Deepak, the way you handled that meeting was really good. I really liked it because... You answered the questions in very succinct forms. You spoke to the other person's uh, concerns. You were well organized in your priesthood. Whatever it is, hmm. if it's behaviorally specific, you're going to learn something. Hmm. And what would it be like if we had organizations where members were committed to each other, and when they saw the other person doing something well, without using as a feedback sandwich, we go in and say, you know, I want to tell you something. You really did that well, and I want to tell you what you did well. Hmm. Everybody would learn more, and we'd have stronger relationships. Hmm. And staying with feedback, uh, you know, when it comes to developmental feedback, David, uh, when you have to uh, share that with uh, your colleagues, especially if you're somebody at a position of power and you're talking to one of your subordinates, what have you learned about doing it well? Um, Okay, um, I'm also going to want to talk about with your boss, what you can do. But let's mm -hmm. stick with your direct report. Mm -hmm. First of all, if you're known as a leader who's concerned with the development of your direct reports, you're going to be a very desired leader. And we say at Stanford in this course, uh, we steal the Hallmark card uh, slogan, we say, I care enough to say the very worst. I think good mm. leaders look for ways they can help develop their direct reports to make them better, which may be to point out what they do well. Uh, they may not be fully aware of, but also where they limit themselves. Mm. So I think that if you as a leader are committed to developing your people as much as they are willing to be developed, the organization uh, benefits, the direct report benefits, and you benefit. Hmm. Now, I think you could also do this with your boss. Mm -hmm. One of the things to realize with this three-person, three-reality um, um, model is that you hold crucial information about the other person that they need. Others don't know the impact of their behavior. You know what your boss does that's useful, that's helpful, and what your boss does that's not so useful and not so helpful. Now, the question is, you've got to be pretty careful about sharing that. But I don't think you have to beat around the bush much. Hmm. What I do, and bosses walk around very frequently complaining. They say, I don't know why people don't speak up. I don't know why people are sitting their hands in the meetings. I don't know why people of them can't uh, raise issues with me. Mm -hmm. well, and what they're saying is, I'm in the dark. I don't know what's going on. Couldn't you say, or oh, gee, boss, that, that sounds upsetting. I don't know why people are doing that. Mm. But I've got a hunch. Well, what would you like to hear? Now, your boss may say, hell no. Then you just go quiet. But the boss might say, well, what, do you, what do you think? Hmm. And then you can say, well, one of the reasons I think 
people are careful in meetings, and it's why I'm careful, is that there are times in which you appear to um, uh, be mad at people. It happened yesterday in the meeting hmm. when Simon raised this point, and this is what you said to him. And I saw him go quiet, and I think I would have gone quiet too. The boss is like to say, well, I think he was wrong. Yeah, that's good. We need to know and do things wrong. But I think it's the way you do it that is causing the problem you're worried about. Can we talk about ways you could raise it? Hmm. Now you're on the boss's side. And not only that, you're the one at direct report who's honest with your boss. Hmm. As bosses walk around wondering what's being kept from them. And you're hmm. saying, I'm not going to keep things from you. Now that's risky. Hmm. That takes courage. Hmm. But I don't think in today's world you get very far by playing it safe. Hmm. And I loved one of the quotes uh, in the book, David. Uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to quote from the book. You know, you say, when problems are complex and intertwined, things can feel messy. Imagine there's a muddy swamp, and you need to cross it to get to the high ground on the other side. At first, you carefully look for carefully look for rocks to step on so that you don't get mud on your shoes. But halfway across the rocks end, and you have a choice: Do I go on and wade through the swamp, or should I just turn around? Uh, can you can you say more about this phenomenon uh, since you spoke about <laughs> risk? Well, let me tell you how I experience. So, let's say I'm raising an issue. Um, okay, I will say with. Well, no. Say with my wife, with Eva, and who I love dearly. And um, I raise one issue and I say, gee, honey, when you do X, you know. And she says, well, as a matter of fact, uh, the reason I do X is because I get really bothered when you do Y. And I say, well, the trouble is that uh, the reason why I do Y is because of, uh, you know, I don't know about this or about that. And she says, there's that. And all of a sudden, what seemed like a very simple piece of feedback is now a pretty muddy swamp mm-hmm. because there are at least five different issues all building on each other. And they probably build on each other because we haven't raised them early enough. Mm-hmm. Okay, which is frequently a problem with all of us. The temptation at this point is to say, oh, it's nothing. And to get turn around and go back away, staying on the on the rocks. And I think what you need to do is you need to say, there's a hell of a lot here and it's pretty messy. Mm. But let's stick in it and see what all these issues are. And rather than using the issues as bludgeons to justify ourselves, let's take it apart. And it may be a longer conversation than you expected. Hmm. And it may be a conversation that can't be resolved in one city. Hmm. city. But can we go through the swamp and clean those up? Okay, I see that when I do X, that's how it bothers you. And you're saying it leads you to do Y. So what can we do about it? And now we can get into problem solving. Remember, Feedback starts a conversation. It doesn't end it. Hmm. We wish it would end it. We wish that I could say, keep up, would you do X? This is the impact on me. And you say, yes, I've got it. That's it. And we walk away. And there are some issues like that, but in most cases, hmm. it's intertwined and we need to work it out and problem solve various ways of doing it. And what we say is, can you take the risk of sticking in there, not getting into the blame game, but focus on behavior and the impact on you? And in a way, what's beautiful that you shared here, David, and you also talk about that in the book, is somebody, ideally both, at least one of them needs to take onus to drive the process of repair and restoration and rejuvenation of the relationship. Right. At some level, there's also an element of uh, taking ownership for that process, 
you know, whatever the outcome might be. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, hopefully both start to take some ownership. It may take one person to initiate, but interpersonal problems almost always have an interpersonal component. Each of us brings something to the issue. Mm. And I've got to be willing to own my part, but I need you to own your part. And part of the conversation, the messiness might be my saying, I'm not hearing you take any responsibility for this. You're, it's sounding as if you think it's all my fault. And that's hard for me because I don't think it is all my fault. I'll, I'll mm. own my part, but I don't have you own yours. So I think both have to take, one may take the initiative to start, but both have to take at least some responsibility. Hmm. Likewise, if it's a relationship both are committed to, both ought to feel some responsibility to make sure that things are okay at the end. Hmm. And, um, and it may be that they aren't quite okay at the end of this meeting and we need to come back to it. So hmm. it's always useful after a difficult conversation, the next day to come back and say, Hey, where are you with that conversation? Hmm. Are you okay? The other person's likely to say, well, as a matter of fact, and you still have a little bit more work to do. Hmm. And a related corollary to that, I guess, David is, you know, uh, this was a term used by one of my guests on the show who runs the half um, halftime institute, a gentleman called Lloyd Reeb. And he uses the term, you need to have a, mass, a side margin in your life. You know, if you fill the page and you don't have space, uh, then, you know, you don't, you don't have the opportunity to, to create the space for some of these conversations. Um, can, can you say a little bit about uh, creating the space for us to be able to address some of these things that... Uh, that emerge as we go through life. There's a phrase uh, called organization problem solving. We didn't have time to do it right the first time, but we had time to clean up all the mistakes about doing it right. Mm. Um, the scarce resource in organization, in fact, the scarce resource in life, I think is time. Mm. It's, it's not money, it's not people, it's not resource, it's time. That's a scarce resource. And the question is, how do we spend our time? And I think we spend our time, a lot of our time, in the secondary issues, mm. not the primary ones. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I make a to-do list. And when you say secondary can, and primary, sorry, David, uh, just for me to understand, how do you distinguish the two? Ah, uh, the primary are the really important issues, the mm. major issues. Mm. And the secondary are the ones that would be nice to clean up, mm. but aren't crucial. And there are relatively few really, really important issues, I think. Well, if I can stay focused on the really, really important issues, then maybe I can find some time, some space for these important, which I think is crucial, these relational mm. issues. Because organizations are held together not by the organization chart, but by relationships. Mm. And if every member of an organization said, who are the key people I need in order to get my job done? And I'm going to pay attention to building those strong relationships. We'd be much more efficient and much more effective. Mm. So David, uh, uh, moving to a different theme as a, as a practicing coach, you know, one of the questions I often think about is, uh, what's in the, what's in the realm of change and what's hardwired in people, right? When I, when we, when we're trying to figure out what are the development areas that we need to focus on, uh, that's a question that often comes up and what's worth, uh, really investing time and, uh, making the effort. How do you uh, how do you think about that? Uh, you talk about that in the book as well. How should we all think about what's hardwired and what's in the realm of change? Well, the distinction people often make is between personality and behavior. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes people say, well, that's just my personality. And I say, I'm not concerned about your personality. I think you know, it's a long discussion. Actually, what is personality? There's a lot of dispute about that. Hmm. I, I would say that that's pretty hard one. I think if I'm introverted versus extroverted, I can become more social, but where I get my energy is, is pretty hard one. But what we're concerned about in organizations, what we're concerned about as leaders, and what we're concerned about in relationships is behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's behavior that's, that's a problem. So I could be an extrovert and I can have good social skills or I could be an extrovert and I could want to dominate the interactional conversations. Not my extroversion. It's the behavioral form it takes. And I think we have a lot of control over our behavior if Mm. we want it. Mm. So I, when I deal with people, the thing which I watch for is how willingness are they to look, how willing are they to look at their behavior and maybe do something about it. If they, in essence, uh, are not at all willing, uh, I say to myself, is this going to be worth the effort? And uh, it may not be. Hmm. So um, the, the the problem I see in, in the coaching I've done with executives is the problem has not been personality. It's been an unwillingness to learn. Hmm. And is that hardwired, yeah. do you think, that uh, to use uh, Carol Dweck's language, the growth mindset versus fixed mindset? Uh, and the willingness to learn and grow. To what extent uh, do you think that's hardwired versus something that we can work on? No, because what she says is that you can learn to have a growth mindset. Mm. She's very clear that that is something that you can learn. Mm. I think where it comes from is probably early socialization. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's probably easier for some than for others. But I think that one can have a growth mindset if you want it. Now, I remember once asking a therapist, um, no, I, I didn't know that that's not the story. Um, I heard this from a therapist that uh, one time a patient asked her, uh, how, do, how do, when am I cured? And the therapist said, when you stop wanting to learn. <laughs> and I don't think that's a cure. I think that's the end of therapy. Hmm. That's when therapy ends. So um, is, is, the, is do you have a mindset of wanting to continue to learn? And it varies with areas. Now, there are some areas where I may not want to learn. So it's not a generalized statement. But there may be other areas in which I do want to learn. Hmm. And I think not being willing to learn is the one dimension that holds most people back in organizations and in relationships. Now, switching frames as a parent, uh, David, I have a 12 year old girl and an eight year old boy. Hmm. As I'm going through this conversation, I'm wondering, you know, what is it that I, as a parent, I can, I can do to, to A, stoke that mindset and B, you know, you talk about running this interpersonal dynamics course at Stanford. What would the equivalent of that course look for a 10 year old? You know, what, what, what are the kinds of things that we as parents need to bear in mind to, to develop, to help kids build these interpersonal skills as they grow? Well, there's a, there's books and there's a field called uh, PET and effectiveness training, mm-hmm. which is very similar concepts. For one thing, with kids, you don't label them. Uh, you, you focus on behavior, you don't label them. Mm. 
let me give an example. When I was, I guess, 10, 9, uh, 10, 12 years old, I still remember the instances. There were several times my mother said, well, David, the trouble is you're just lazy. Mm. Uh, turned out to be a very destructive comment because I said, that's who I am. And I said to myself, gee, if I don't work hard, I'm going to end up on the streets. And I saw myself as a lazy person had to overcome it. Well, anybody who knows me knows I'm constantly working. Hmm. So that was a label. And when we label kids, they take it in as who they are. Now, if she would have said, you ha you're having a hard time getting your homework done on time, that's a behavior. Hmm. Then we could have done something. So I think we have to be careful about labeling. The other thing is we have to legitimize their feelings. Hmm. So I have a story in which I'm not proud about, but I think it's very uh, revealing. When my son was about four years old, five years old, he went down a slide and hit the back of his head and the edge of the slide. I was crying. I rushed over and I said, oh, Jeffrey, you're not hurt. And with tears running down his face, he said, how do you know how I feel? Only I know how I feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he had me. He was right. Uh, what I should have said was, I'm upset that you're hurting. But I was delegitimizing his feelings. Hmm. And we delegitimize it all the time. We say, oh, you shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't, um, your older sister shouldn't be uh, mad at your, uh, your older daughter, shouldn't be mad at her brother just because he's now getting more attention. Well, she's mad. She's envious. That's the way it is. Hmm. I was reading so, a book. Yeah, apologies. Huh? I was reading a book called Toxic Positivity. Uh, where it talks about this notion of not being present to the emotion that's emerging, but really quickly brushing it off with a with a positive emotion. Yes, yes. You you ought to be feeling this kind of thing. Yes. What you're feeling is what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. I may not like that I'm feeling that way, but I'm feeling that. So I think as a parent, can we focus on behavior, legitimize our feelings, and can we also be open to our own being that? Can we say, hey, am I doing something that's uh, causing a problem? Hmm. Hmm. Moving to, a, to an adjacent theme, David, um, a few days back, I was in conversation with uh, Jeffrey Pfeffer at Stanford, uh -huh. who, yes. is, who, who talks about power. Yes. One, of, one of the segments we spoke about was uh, warmth and competence, you know, how leaders need to strike a balance, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the way they signal warmth and competence in different uh, settings. And some of the stuff he says is, you know, if you, you need to come across as competent first for you to really have the influence and then, you know, uh, for you to be able to get things done. And 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 I got a sense. Uh, he he talks about the notion of vulnerability being uh, often counterproductive if you're solving for power. Do you do you see a, um, a difference of opinion uh, in the way you look at the subject versus him, or is it is it just that uh, you're saying the same thing but from different lenses? I think we're we're somewhat different, but we uh, I would nuance it differently. Mm -hmm. There are two types of vulnerability. <clears throat> One vulnerability raises questions about my core competence. Mm. So when I taught the le leadership class at Stanford, I said, if in the first day of class, I said, I actually don't know anything about leadership, but I was assigned this course. Mm. I would be crushed as they rushed out of the room, as they should. Mm. That's 
vulnerability which raises questions about my competence. There's also a vulnerability about me as a human. Hmm. I remember the time in which I was teaching that class and um, my son had, was quite ill. And I went to class and I said, uh, I'm really going to try and be present, but I have to tell you, my son is ill and uh, I'm feeling distracted. But I'm really going to try to be here. Hmm. That raised all sorts of support, caring, and so on. I was showing my humanness. By the way, my saying that allowed me to be even more present. Hmm. But that's a side effect. So I, I think what we're talking about is when we talk about vulnerability, what are we vulnerable about? The other thing is there's a difference between competence in having the answer and competence in finding the answer. Hmm. And I think leaders who pretend they have the answer to everything lose credibility because it's too transparent. But I think the leader who says, we are going to be able to solve this even though I don't have the answer now, but I have every confidence that we could solve this, is both more honest hmm. and more trust building. Hmm. So uh, when, uh, when I go in as a consultant, I'm frequently asked by the client, the executive, have you faced this problem before? I'm not going to say, well, I don't know anything about it. What I'm likely to say is I've solved things that are similar and I'm sure we can figure this out hmm. because what the client wants to know is that it's going to be solved. Hmm. And my trying to say, oh, I have the answer right away is false and they'll see through it. Hmm. And hmm. I don't think Jeff makes that those those the six things. Hmm. Got it. David, this podcast is titled Play to Potential. Um, uh, as we wrap up, uh, it's a question that I ask all the people that come on this show. What does the term mean to you? What does it take to play to potential the way you see it? To, to, to play? To potential. Play to potential? Well, first of all, I think it's two things. One is, um, am I willing to grow? Now, to grow means that I'm going to make mistakes. Hmm. But I've had more than one executive say to me, I've never made mistakes. I've only had learning opportunity. So I think if you play to potential, you're going to take risks. Hmm. And you're going to fail sometimes. But the question is, are you going to learn from it? Hmm. The second thing is, is that to say, am I going to play to potential? I'm going to need some help. Think of professional sports players. They have coaches. I think that if I can say I'm going to reach my potential, if I'm willing to learn from other people, if I'm open to feedback, and so often in organizations, when things go wrong, we bury it. We put it aside. Hmm. We, we don't learn from it, including making a mistake. To what extent can an executive say, you know, I really blew that decision. I really want to learn from that. What do you think I did wrong? Hmm. Now that takes courage. But I think that you only can reach your potential if you're willing to try and you're willing to hear from other people. And very few leaders are willing to do that. Lovely. On that note, David, uh, real pleasure having you on the, on the podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Well, I've enjoyed it. Those were great questions and enjoyed our interaction. Absolutely. Fun to be with you. Likewise, David, and it's 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 always inspiring to see somebody who's 
it was really uh, you know i was uh, if i may digress for 30 seconds i was watching this documentary uh, jiro dreams of sushi i don't know if you've ever seen it no it's about a japanese chef uh, who's uh, operating a tiny little restaurant in one of the basements of a japanese metro station and uh, and he's been doing it for 50 years or 60 years and when apparently barack obama visited tokyo he went and had a a a meal in that restaurant in that subway the point being he's taken something like sushi making to an art form by just really uh-huh. focusing on it over decades and the, and the documentary talks about the various elements of you know the things that he focuses on so similarly i guess interpersonal dynamics is a lot more critical to our lives than sushi so it's it's wonderful that someone like you is really <laughs> uh, sort of really chiseled away at this uh, over decades thank you thank you good luck then thank you david